Dungeons and Dragons, and frankly most of the fantasy and fantasy adjacent RPGs out there, they all have some kind of mushroom people. And it makes sense given that most of the sapient species in these kinds of games are just X people, like cat people, rock people, frog people, blue people, angel people. We take some of the attributes of that extrinsic element, paste it onto a human framework, see how that might change the baseline human being, and done. We have a whole new species now. With mushroom people, such as myconids, the tendency tends to be they're a relaxed, very peaceful, even dreadfully sometimes pacifistic people with a somewhat odd system of values that live in dark places. They're rarely outright villainous, and sometimes when they are, like the orcs in Warhammer 40k, they are, to a certain extent, always played for laughs. If you want some real alien cosmic horror, you get yourself some illithids or some fucking star spawn, the forces of chaos in Warhammer, maybe the mysterious Fey in World of Darkness. And I think this attitude does the humble fungus a huge disservice. If they have creature types, like D&D, which a lot of systems do, usually the first great crime that they will commit is to classify all kinds of fungal creatures that they have as plants. Which is bullshit, because fungi are not fucking plants. They're not, as you might believe, animals either. They are just Fungi, it's a whole kingdom of life of its own. And because we as a culture focus so much on the classic red with white spots, fly agaric mushroom, or maybe even for culinary reasons, the occasional portobello, we sort of forget the sheer range and beauty and interestingness of what the fungus kingdom has to offer. This horrid growth right here is called the dead man's fingers, and no, it doesn't always Always grow like that, but you'd be surprised how often it does. Speaking of human anatomy, the false morel or moral, I don't actually know how to properly pronounce that. Maybe I should have looked that up before recording the video. You can't tell me it doesn't look like a brain. Now this one you might have actually seen before because, I mean, it's very extraordinary looking. It's called the blood mushroom for obvious reasons. And though we do understand that kind of like blood, the red stuff is a nutrient solution, we're not quite sure why it has that color. This right here is the orange jelly fungus, absolutely gorgeous if you ask me. It exists in a very interesting state of being edible and non-edible. It's just that you know, it's not poisonous, it's not gonna do anything bad to you, it's just that people don't eat it because it tastes like nothing. Except apparently for a group of vegetarians, who do eat it, because they like the non-taste of it, I guess. Speaking of, slime molds are really one of the most interesting forms of fungal life, in my opinion. I mean, just look at this, just look at the amount of visual information, of details that you can use to describe fungi in a, in a varied and interesting way. Complex networks, the globules, the bulbs, the bundled stalks that create these sort of platforms. Which actually brings me to a huge problem that I have with how D&D classifies monsters. There shouldn't be a slime category. It shouldn't be in there. That should be a fungus category, which includes myconids and their cousins, and all of the slimes, because slimes are fungi. And they actually do tend to embody many of the interesting, and let's be honest, rather horrid aspects that make fungi into such interesting adversaries that can evoke, like, truly primal fears. Most prominently, of course, their drive to consume, which is, you know, being consumed by this outside force that has no intent. It just moves ahead and chews, destroys. You can't even see the mouth that it has. That's a very basic primal fear that people respond to very much. And yeah, of course, it's it's scary getting eaten, but have you also, in addition, considered this? Aside from maybe the concept of entropy, fungi are the best manifestation in terms of ideas of the death. Just death. 
The number one place where you find more mushrooms than anywhere else is where things have died. We're talking like animal carcasses or human carcasses, dead trees, dead trees are famous for sporting vast arrays of mushrooms, also other plants that are dead that are not trees. This isn't of course limited to the forest either. We like to think of nature as this like separated space from the world of the civilized structures of man. But fungi don't really care about that. They thrive in concrete. They thrive in plastic. They thrive in metal. They can grow to these huge sizes while coming out of just these tiny invisible spores that can hide in cracks and crevices that we cannot even conceive of because they're so small. And we talk about tardigrades being hardy. There's plenty of spores that can survive space. No matter where you are, how you died, you cannot get away from the fact that you will be eaten by them. You will be transformed by them. You will be subsumed into them. You know the whole Shrigma male thing of you cannot kill me in any way that matters and decay exists as an extant form of life? What are you gonna do to the mushroom? What are you going to do? How are you going to stop it? You're going to tear it apart, distribute it over the land? It's going to regrow! It will consume itself if it has to! Fungi a death. They are the Grim Reaper. You cannot cut up the Grim Reaper into pieces so small that he will be killed. He is the Grim Reaper! You can't even burn them! There's so many spores that really just will survive that. Even just because they're in some sort of marginally protected space that, once again, you couldn't even think of. They're not even individuals as such. They don't care about any given particular aspect of themselves. They are a force with a purpose that we can see but not understand, spanning vast amounts of species. And some say they have some strange, unexplored form of intelligence. Terence McKenna and Paul Stamets, two of the most influential mycologists of all time, believe that the sort of shared nervous system of fungi that spans our world has a sort of sapience contained in it, a form of intelligence that is aware of us people and trying to communicate with us. Because fungi talk. Plants also talk, uh, they do it to a much more limited extent, and most of the communication that plants engage in actually happens through the mycelium, which they're hooked up with at their roots. We tend to think of the mushroom, you know, the thing with the stalk and the bulb on top, the, the semi-half ball. Whatever the fucking word for that is. We tend to think of, of that as like the self-contained life form, but it's not. It's just a, a tiny, tiny little fraction of the fungus as a whole. It's just the fruiting body. The thing that is designed to look the most impressive, essentially. The overwhelming majority of the fungus is underground in a vast, Forest spanning, beyond forest spanning, we honestly have no idea how huge it is. Network of strands that carry information and nutrients uh, through an infinite amount of nodes, communicating with the, an unimaginably vast array of different organisms. They are the internet of the forest and they don't just transport nutrients, we know this. They actually actively adapt to changing circumstances. And I'm talking like large scale circumstances. We talk about the blue whale as the biggest life form that has ever existed, but by our definition of life form, fungi truly do span entire forests. People also talk about the oceans being an oh so unexplored place that we know nothing about. You can go out into your garden right now, grab a handful of dirt, and you will, within that handful of dirt, have countless, completely unidentified, never-before-seen species of fungus. The mycelial network is vast, it's complex, it's redundant, and it very much does appear to be a sort of nervous system of the forest. Conceptually, if you think about artificial intelligence, the kind of computing substrate that those would be running on is much more dissimilar to the way that our brain works than that 
alien brain spanning the forest floor. So if you can conceptualize AI, this should be much easier to conceptualize. And fungi don't just talk to each other through like the underground network of roots, they also do it by just touching each other, like the fruiting bodies. Even across different species, they will start chattering animatedly. Would you like to hear what that sounds like? <laughs> I found this channel in the process of doing research for making this video and doesn't that sound exactly what you would think mushrooms talking to each other would sound like? I highly encourage you to check out that channel by the way, it's it, Michael Lyko. It's so cool, it's very interesting to just see all these different mushroom species. They have their own sort of tones that they produce that are individual to that given species. And the same is true about, you know, plants, uh, which he also plays with. And sometimes even crystals, where uh, it's fascinating because the sounds are, of course, much more static. Point is, there is something going on here in terms of communication, and the plants are in on it. At least to some extent, they actively communicate through the mycelium. And now consider that plants are about as related to mushrooms as we are. And think about why all of these leading mycologists are so adamant about the idea that the mushrooms are trying to talk to us. These are entities made of decay. They do not die as we understand it. We cannot truly end them or hurt them in a way that would really devastate them. And they are vastly more ancient than even our oldest civilizations. They are truly the closest thing we have to gods. And you know, given that shamans like to do shrooms to receive messages from the spirit world, well, if this all sounds like a lot of mumbo jumbo to you, which it certainly does to me, I mean, yeah, these guys are scientists, but they have done a lot of magic mushrooms over the course of their lives. The nice thing about this video is that we're not talking about the real world. We're talking about fantasy role-playing games, where none of the realism shit matters. We can just take these ideas and run with them to a place that's very interesting. I'm not worried about the scientific accuracy of anything said in this video, any of the statements, whether you can make a study for- I'm trying to fucking have- play pen and paper games with my friends. I'm trying to fu do- roll dice. And in that realm, having the mystique, the eldritchness, the- the alien nature of mushrooms, represented by like a group of peaceful, sort of telepathic people that walk have legs that like mushrooms with legs kind of it it's kind of boring myconids are completely anthropomorphized out of their vast potential but of course it is true that uh having this not even like a hive mind built out of various individual intelligences, just straight up a decentralized mind. That's not really something you can easily turn into a stat block and assign like points and skills to it that you can then kill with your players. And of course, I have to be honest, I do think like the aesthetic of the- I like the way mushroom people look. I think it looks cool when they like walk around and they do their telep and they have like a stick and they do- I- I like it! I just think that, like, only having that as a thing, or even making those too individual, too relatable to human beings, is a huge waste of potential. Sticking with the whole gods thing for a moment, I mean, what if the gods that the people of your world worship are actually entities residing within the mycelium? I mean, at least the natural gods, if you don't want to make all of them part of that. So it would make sense for, like, nature-associated spellcasters, like druids uh, or shamans, to be able to sort of have high-speed communication, even in this medieval fantasy world, through this sort of, like, forest internet. When we think of fantasy magic Skype, we usually uh, see, like, the arcane wizards in their towers and all that, because they feel more modern and, like, high-tech in relation to, like, their their druidic sort of cousins, but it's actually the druids that have the naturally occurring infrastructure to do this kind of thing. Of course, to make that all interesting, we shouldn't 
just like transmit one-to-one -one perfect data, maybe we can leave that to the arcane spellcasters, but this much vaster network, it should be a little bit impressionistic, a little bit distorted, a little bit more associated with feelings and emotions than actual visual things that you can see. You might even be able to become a great spy master by just hooking yourself up to a bunch of mushrooms. You know, like that character from Game of Thrones, the old guy in the tree. Which, there, it's done through the trees, but it, you know, realistically, that would be the, I mean, realistically. That would really be the mushrooms doing the heavy lifting, is what I'm trying to say. And some of you might have already made this connection, but all of this does kind of feel a little tied in with the concept of the fairy world, right? The Feywild. These two are utterly alien entities occupying a sort of bizarro world that's not entirely unlike our own world while being at the same time completely different. You know, like the real world when you're on shrooms. What if the Feywild is a plane of existence created through the sort of dream of these both sleeping and awake god entities? A sort of virtual reality, if you will, that you might occasionally find yourself stepping into where you will encounter creatures that you might recognize because they're trying to adapt to the way that you think and you perceive the world. They might look humanoid, but they are truly, utterly alien. It's a world of surreality, a world of hallucination. If you want some inspiration on how to run uh, the Fey as a cosmic horror type thing and the Fey world in general, I really recommend checking out the Changeling books. Uh, from World of Darkness. They have a lot- they basically do it like that. They have a lot of excellent material if you want to run things that way in any system. Speaking of changelings, fungi have been known to mimic specifically the eggs of birds, which is what changelings do when they mimic your children and they come into your house and they replace your children. But there are also a lot of smaller scale ideas that we can explore here. And what I really want you to walk away with from this video uh, is a lot of different ideas that you can use to sort of customize fungi to your own experience to make them fit into your world in a way that you like. We are trying to create a sense of fungus and like interesting great large-scale world building implications notwithstanding the things that your players are actually going to encounter and remember are the mechanics and the details and the way that the world around them acts in specific ways. Those are the thematic elements that really shape the experience. A big theme with fungi is of course mind control and not just because of the magic mushrooms which maybe I don't know that might be a common thing that people do. It is rather common in many cultures. Uh, you pop them maybe they plant subconscious triggers in your mind. Who knows what these mushrooms get up to? But the real thing that actually makes us motivated to think about mind control when it comes to fungi is this baby right here, uh, Ophicordyceps unilateralis, also known as the mushroom what turn aunt into zombie. But the reason this happens is that the spore organism sort of goes into the brain, uh, takes over the nervous system of the aunt and makes the aunt seek a high place while it like gets digested to nourish the spore so it can grow the fruiting body out of its head and from that high place be distributed better by the wind. Now to chill you out a little bit, uh, this kind of thing couldn't happen to humans. Human brains are just way too complicated for even the- there's other organisms that we think have theorized, hypothesized, have like mind controlling powers like T. Gondi, uh, but they- none of them can like truly take over <clears throat> the vast structure of our brain and consciousness. But the theory is that they can influence us, which in my opinion, especially for a role playing game, is much more interesting. And if you don't even want to play with that, you can just go for the straight mind control because again, it's a fantasy role playing game. The zombies in The Last of Us, if I remember correctly, are actually also fungi. And I think they're a very interesting example of how such creatures might work. It fits very well with the whole zombie theme. Uh, and then you can connect the whole zombie theme with the whole Feywild theme. They don't really think as individuals, they are uh, more instinctive creatures, or rather creatures that might act with some sort of intelligence, but intelligence that we cannot comprehend, it's too different from our own. But of course there's more than just humans, there's a whole kingdom animalia that you can play around with, create some truly interesting and disgusting 
body horror. So many creature types and so many different abilities that the mushrooms might be able to take over and modify for their own purposes. There's a sort of spectrum of symmetry in nature where mushrooms being especially colony organisms we really expect them to grow in various different shapes that aren't particularly well defined plants are similar they have more symmetry than fungi they have more clearly defined areas that we can perceive uh, and that have more clearly defined structures but ultimately the details and the actual way that it goes is entirely emergent the roots the trunks the structure no two trees will actually look significantly the same so when we have fungi distorting their silhouette this isn't particularly unsettling to us it's entirely expected but in the kingdom animalia there are very few life forms that do not have what we call bilateral symmetry and when their shape is distorted we find that very weird it's a true mutation that sort of really upsets something deep within our stomach it's wrong it's obviously not the way it should be often this is paired with a certain degree of decomposition because of course you know mushrooms fungi are the literal incarnation of death and decay making these animals that they have taken over in a very literal sense undead but if you want to focus more on uh, visually representing the growth aspect than the decay aspect of the mushrooms you are of course also free to do that you can take just regular animals and then add these visual descriptors these details of like lichen weaves uh, slime networks that span parts of their body or maybe their entire body uh, it should be rather irregular so if it spans the entire body even though it seems more complete it feels like more normal if that makes any sense uh, plateaus of mushroom growth little colonies very easy to severely distort a silhouette and of course to make it look very subtle but also if you know a little bit about the mushrooms uh, make it rather scary mycelial hyphae in terms of gameplay mechanics the whole spores affecting brain chemistry thing can be used for so much more than the blunt instrument of mind control it's such a versatile tool that could make you more docile for a while you know less violent maybe sad depressed very happy euphoric horny potentially that's one that you should really talk with your players about beforehand specifically some of them might have a huge problem with it doesn't always need to be you do this now and act against your teammates it could be that they are sort of debilitated for a bit because they're laughing in stitches at that point which is something that can happen to you when for instance you do magic mushrooms so thematically it fits so well if you are for instance a sort of warlock and you have a, a mushroom god patron or you know frankly cleric it's the same fucking thing this kind of thing could be a huge buff to your allies or a debuff for your enemies because you could absolutely imbue your friends with courage you could really let's bards honestly why there isn't there like a mushroom bard of course you could reach for another blunt instrument and head for the deadly spores town which would also be very on brand because fungi do produce some of the most toxic substances known to science and let's be honest the concept of a tiny invisible organism that will kill you even in small amounts if you do something as basic as breathing is kind of horrifying and will require some very creative problem solving to give the whole deadly spores thing another much more game-like and simpler even kinetic aspect pylobolus crystallinus has this thing where it can shoot its spores and it does so with immense force like in relative terms much stronger than any shotgun blast which is also a way that you can represent this visually it doesn't have to be like a bullet the way that this baby does it it could also be the big cone of fire i could very much imagine some interesting encounters with like a, a massive powerful bear that exudes a constant noxious mantle of spores a stag that has a lot of these like spore guns mounted on its head and will shoot you from a distance a fox that warps your mind with hallucinations as it hunts you bringing you to a point where even this little creature can take down a seasoned adventurer an important factor to consider is that uh, the more in the grips of the spore organism a creature is which should definitely be a spectrum just to make things a lot more interesting the less of a will to self-preservation it ought to have i mean that's one of the most 
terrifying aspects of fighting the undead in any sort of combat encounter. It's such a distinct advantage that they have that they do not look out for their own protection. Of course, this contrast very easily disappears if every single combat encounter, every single creature that you find always fights until the very last hit point. But that's an angry rant for another day. For fungi, there's really not that much of a difference between a, a live life form and a dead life form. It just sort of stops moving. The material is all still there. You can consume it. You can grow more of yourself as the spores out of it. Remember, you cannot kill them in any meaningful way. You can just take away their ability to walk for a bit. Whichever parts of the fungal colony on that creature are still alive because they are such decentralized organisms, they should continue doing whatever it was that they did. They should continue spewing out toxic gas, they should continue shooting at you with the magic gun mind controlling you. It isn't even just a temporary inconvenience because not only do they think on vastly larger timescales, they don't think on timescales at all is a huge decentralized mind that just sort of exists. Time isn't something that is a concept to them, much like death. Remember, these are creatures that do not have any sort of individuality. They are more a force of nature than anything else. The whole thing with the D&D Myconids, where they have these like horizontal sort of circle family-like structures and a hierarchy with the sovereign. Wow, it's so human. It's such a waste. They are so alien, it should be impossible to even attribute concepts like malice or self-defense to them. They do what they do because they do it, and their reasoning is so far beyond human understanding that maybe even you, as the game master, shouldn't know it. But of course, many of the representations we've talked about th thus far are a bit more on the evil side, at least from the like perspective of humans. They are destructive, but they are fundamentally collaborative organisms that coexist in symbiosis with pretty much all other life forms on Earth, and this is also an aspect that I think we can and should explore. We, humanity, have used fungi as a core part of our culture for thousands of years. We used them to make all three of the major food groups, beer, cheese, and bread. In medicine, I mean they're literally antibiotics. That, to the mind of a person from before antibiotics times, is a magical concept. This saved the lives of billions of people. We also use certain kinds of fungi in organ transplants and prosthetics because they have a way of relaxing strong autoimmune responses, which gets rid of the main problem with these kinds of things, which is like rejection by the body. Really interesting how well equipped they are for interfacing with people, isn't it? And in a world of fungus gods and magic, this could absolutely lead to sort of cybernetics in a medieval setting, and not just peg legs. If you go a bit farther out with the magic of mechanics and advance the technology just a little bit, you don't have to be precisely medieval fantasy. Who does that even? They could be like really advanced cyberpunk level cybernetics. All that body horror doesn't need to be evil mind control, it can be beneficial modification of humanity. And it's not like the mushrooms are gonna stop us from it or fuck us over for it. They don't care about us unlocking their secrets. They don't have any grand malicious schemes. Or maybe they do, who knows. One very interesting application for mushrooms that science is currently exploring is the fact that they can sort of suck up pollution, which thematically is kind of the opposite of what they are often used to represent in fiction. And this is stuff like microplastics and oil spills, but very interestingly, radioactive waste also. <laughs> and yes, you heard that right. There's a class of fungi called radiotropic fungi that can't just survive in highly irradiated environments. They thrive there. They grow from them. They gain energy from radiation through a process called radiosynthesis, which is like photosynthesis 
for radiation. And yes, nerds, I am aware that that's also not too far removed from photosynthesis either. I understand that. And they're so efficient at binding radioactive materials that scientists have considered cultivating them in places like Chernobyl, where they were originally found, in order to clean them up more quickly. In spaceflight, they might be used as a highly effective layer of insulation against cosmic radiation. Imagine for a moment spaceships, giant spacecraft made out of the alien material of the mushroom that maybe travel to far and distant places, not through the hyperspace, but through the surreal bent space of the mycelium hallucination Feywild world. Do you see now how fungi are actually dreadfully underutilized as eldritch entities that literally grow in your garden? Especially with the pollution aspect, I'm thinking maybe you could have a whole thing where they get mutated by the pollution. Like there's a, a, a demonic spillage from the hell world that they're put there to suck up by some druids. Maybe there's a rift in the veil between the living world and the dead world. Consider the terrifying power of mushroom devils, or the, the complex minds of once human souls now inhabiting the alien thought substrate of the mycelium. This is a great excuse if you haven't had enough connections to various other different thematic areas to infuse your mushrooms with pretty much anything you want to come up with. Angelic fungi, electric fungi, crystalline fungi. You literally, there is an infinite amount of different interesting flavorful combinations you can come up with. And you know I love those interesting and flavorful combinations. So take all that, sit with it for a while, and let yourself be inspired. Thank you very much for watching this video. Like, comment, subscribe, share this to your relevant communities, but do not spam them. Consider supporting me on Patreon or Subscribestar, buying some of my merchandise or my short story I never get this right. <laughs> in this area. <laughs> and in that spirit, I really hope that I've like opened your mind on all the stuff that you can do with mushrooms. Because when I embarked on this journey, I had no idea the amount of interesting shit that I would find. And see you around, cunts.